Professor Kantorovich teaches at Northwestern University School of Law, where he specializes in constitutional and international law. He has been called on to advise lawyers in historic piracy trials around the world and is working on a book on international law for Harvard University Press. His scholarship has been published in leading academic journals and his expertise is often sought out and quoted by major news organizations such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, NPR News, Associated Press, LA Times, and numerous television and radio programs. Professor Kantorovich's writings on Israel have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Jerusalem Post, and numerous other publications. He is an internationally sought after lecturer and speaks frequently about the legal and historical aspects of the Israeli-Arab conflict at synagogues and to student groups at dozens of universities across the country. He has been honored with a fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton in 2011-2012 and with the Federalist Society's prestigious Bator Award given annually to a young scholar under 40 for outstanding scholarship and teaching. After attending the University of Chicago for college and law school, he ultimately taught there. After law school, he clerked for Judge Richard Posner on the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. In a previous career, he was a newspaper man at the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, and for many years at the Forward, where he reported from New York, Washington, Israel, and Lebanon. Professor Kantorovich will take your questions following his presentation. Please write your question or questions on the cards we have provided. Please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices. And it is with great pleasure I give you Professor Eugene Kantorovich. And uh, I've been asked to speak both about international legal issues uh, relating to Israel and uh, its borders, but also to put this in the context of uh, the elections and America's relationship with, with Israel. So uh, the question, what does the election mean for, for Israel, uh, we don't really know the answer to that. It's, it is too early to tell, uh, and the Torah teaches us that the minds of kings, and Obama certainly has the status, President of the United States has the status of a king. Uh, the mind of kings is determined by God, so we, we don't really know what's going to happen, but we can try to figure it out using the tools we have, and a good place to start is to think about what happened in the first four years. And in the first four years, I think we saw three major developments. When, when people talk about uh, the, the record of President Obama with regards to Israel, they often say, well, what did he do so bad? Israel's still there, everything's still the same. What, actu what actually happened? Now, in the world of diplomacy, bad things can happen without anything actually being moved. But I think I, think I would sketch out three, three important things w which happened, and I think they have a, a common denominator. So the first thing, a concrete action that one can point to, not words or posture, right? Because it, President Obama is not required to write or to like Prime uh, Minister Netanyahu. They're not required to be friends. He's not required to treat him nicely. He's not required to be polite. That, that, that's not so important. That, that he has a right to disagree with him. But one thing that's very concrete is President Obama repudiated the letter which George Bush sent to Israel, which was not just a letter like a pen pal letter. This was a serious diplomatic commitment. The, the Bush letter was in exchange, it was in consideration for the withdrawal from Gaza. It was in the wake of the withdrawal from Gaza saying Israel, was, Israel wanted to gain international credibility and this was supposed to lock in an understanding that Israel has made already painful concessions there's constant discussion. Israel needs to prove it's going to make it's ready to make painful concessions. And Israel, of course, the more painful concessions Israel makes, the more there is a demand that it prove it's willing to make painful concessions. So the Bush letter, the point was to say, yes, we see you you have made painful concessions, and and that buys you something. And what it bought was an American understanding that Israel, at a minimum, would keep major settlement blocks in Jerusalem. But that's not an item for negotiation, and and the uh, and the Palestinian right of return is also not an item for negotiation. So is that a lot? Maybe not, but it's something. 
and it was the first time the United States recognized it. And President Obama, and it wasn't just a, a letter from Bush, like in a personal capacity, like Dear Bibi. It was endorsed by both houses of Congress. It was a formal, official, public thing. President Obama said, never happened. Never happened. So that's one thing. The elimination of the Bush guarantees. And indeed, what the Bush guarantees were replaced with was the State Department speech. The State Department speech is the flip side of the uh, tearing up the Bush letter. In the State Department speech, President Obama said, the 1967 borders will be a starting point for negotiations. What's that mean? When you really think about the implications, when people say, oh, land swaps, okay, what's a land swap mean? That means if Israel wants the Kotel, it has to pay with it with Tel Aviv. So this actually has gone further than any previous president. And instead of just putting the West Bank and Gaza on the table, all of Israel is in hawk now. You want to keep Mala Adumim? So that nothing is locked in. There's no so what well, land swaps seem like nice and flexible, but what they mean is there is no guaranteed sovereignty. Sovereignty of pre who, who is asked to swap their sovereign territory? Who is asked to give up our existing sovereign territory? So it actually casts a cloud of title over all of Israel. Because it's all up for up for swap. And that that is the uh, flip side of the uh, of the Bush letter. And, and how much is the Kotel worth? Well, surely not just a similar amount of land. Uh, in, in, in the Negev, it's probably worth a lot. What's the swap ratio? Uh, so, so that's another thing. And I, I think finally and most significantly, the settlement freeze. The settlement freeze is a real thing. People forget about it because it, it's passed. But for nearly a year, Jews, simply by virtue of being Jews and living in Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, were not allowed to not only build a house, add on a shed, make a school, and President Obama insisted on this a great deal. Right? And after the, after the 10 month freeze expired, there was a request for another two month for a three month freeze. Freeze was a big deal, a big push. And but we didn't see the pressure that there must have been for the freeze. See, this is what we don't see. We have to imagine what goes on behind the scenes. So we know President, uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu, he's supposedly a big right winger. And you have this right wing Prime Minister impose a settlement freeze for the first time in Israeli history, the first time since 1967, which Livni didn't do, and Olmert didn't do, and Perez didn't do. So the arm twisting must have been quite painful. And what's the, so what's the point of a settlement freeze? Okay, so they froze, now they unfreeze. If you can't build an addition to your house, if you can't build a school for your children, what's it mean? It means you don't act, you're not actually supposed to be there. You're a trespasser that the settlement freeze is already a determination and an acknowledgement, this is not your land. Because if, if you're normal people, normal civilians living in a normal place, whatever sovereignty issues there are, you can build a school, you can build a house. So it's to already say, we've already determined that your trespasses, this is not your land. So that's what's happened in the past. Uh, and what's to happen in the future? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. But what, do, what does all this have in common? What does all this have in common? First of all, a funny thing about the 1967 borders. It's a very unfelicitous phrase, the 1967 borders. Because of course, the 1967 borders were actually created in 1949. They were eliminated in 1967. And this is something everybody should really be familiar with. The very first sentence of the Israel-Jordan armistice agreement. That is to say, the treaty, the instrument which created the Green Line the Green Line never existed on any map before 1949. It was created as the furthest point of Jordanian aggression and Egyptian aggression into Israel. And when they, they fought them, they fought, the armies fought to a standstill. And then they looked where the soldiers were and they drew a line and said, we're going to temporarily stop shooting here. And what the armistice agreement says, the, the very agreement that creates that line, it says this is not a border. Right? It's a, not a territorial not construed in any sense as a political or territorial boundary. So the very thing that creates the Green Line says it's not a border in 1949. So it's the non-border of 1949, probably m much more accurate than the... Uh, and then they go on to you see it's not a border because Jordan goes on to say we reserve the right to conquer the rest of it. And Israel says we, we also reserve the same right. It's the only thing they could agree on. 
right? This is why it's the first article. That this is not the border was the only thing they had in common. So, very hard to understand why it would be called uh, a border, uh, a, a border today. So, wh what does all this have in common? It seems the major theme, the major theme, the settlements. The settlements come out as a very important thing. They're important for the president. They're now important uh, for uh, for Abbas. The, the they're very important in the uh, in, in the in, in, in the rhetoric of groups like Peace Now, and maybe this is where um, and, and J Street, and maybe this is where the president got the idea. So, what's what's the big deal about settlements? Well, why are settlements so the uh, the Jewish civilian presence? Why are Jewish civilian presence so crucial? Uh, and I can suggest a few reasons. I can suge uh, suggest a few reasons. So first of all, it exploits, it's a very good issue to, to pick on as the, as the frontal attack on Israel because it exploits internal Jewish divisions. A uh, small percentage of Israelis, about 5%, live in the settlements. So it opens up a divide and conquer strategy. Not all Jews understand the importance or even the legal legitimacy of Israel's claims. To these, land, to, the, to these lands, and so it's a good wedge issue. But it goes further than that. The Palestinians understand quite well, I think, the legal basis for Israel's territorial claims, namely the League of Nations mandate as amended by the British to create a separate state in Jordan. And that is the fundamental basis for all of Israel's territorial claims in international law. The League of Nations mandate doesn't have a West Bank exception, has an East Bank exception, which, was crea which created Jordan. And the very same thing that gives Israel a legal right to the West Bank, the League of Nations mandate, is what gives it the right to the rest of it. So if you undermine the right to the West Bank, it's clear that intellectually you undermine the right to the West Bank. Well, then you can say, when you're done with that, well, what gives you the right to the rest of it? Well, the League of Nations mandate would be the normal answer. Uh, you, you just said, but, but we just said the League of Nations mandate doesn't give you the West Bank, so what, does it give it or not give it? It would be very hard to say that the League of Nations mandate gives Israel a right to everything except what Jordan and Egypt illegally occupied from 1949 to 1967. So either the, either the League of Nations mandate creates rights or it doesn't. So that's one thing. And also, of course, the, um, so it undermines both the international legal and, of course, the Jewish historical and, and religious uh, claims to these lands if we say these, these are not our places. Uh, the, uh, these, belong to some, these belong to somebody else. The pa Palestinians, I think, understand this quite well. Let me see, which is my pointer here? Is it pointer? Oh, there we go. So, it, it's a bit of a complicated argument to say, look, this is a Palestinian state. This, is, this belongs to the Palestinians. And then you're going to skip over here, and this belongs to the Palestinians also. Like, how is it that this stuff in here doesn't belong to the Palestinians? And let's say there's Arabs living here too. Indeed, there are. A pretty Arab area. So, what, how did it come to be? How is it that Palestinian, not Palestinian, Palestinian? Surely, like this area in between should probably also be Palestinian. This doesn't make sense. Um, how do you have a people that are separated like that? So. If you, have the, if, you, if you have the bracketed positions, the middle falls into place almost logically. What kind of country can be separated like that? It doesn't make much, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, East, yeah, East Pakistan, uh, which became Bangladesh. So actually, it's not such a, uh, a, radi uh, uh, a radical idea, but that didn't work out well for them either. Um, and, and the admission is, the admission of course, the idea, of the, uh, the, the idea is to admit that we, we, are, we are aliens here. Uh, we are, are not here by right. We rolled in in 1967 that we were not here before. So I think that that's the importance of the focus on the settlements. Um, and what will the next four years entail? I would anticipate if there's pressure on Israel, it would come again in the form of pressure on settlement type issues. And this is what, so what I would like to very much stress Different people think different issues related to Israel are important to fight about, and people have different opinions about the settlements. But in a war, you have to fight the battle where it's pitched. So because 
the other side has chosen to take their stand on settlements, and they understand, they see that as a weakness, as an entry, as a wedge issue, that's where all of our energies have to be devoted. That's that. You don't choose where the battle is pitched. You don't say, I want to fight on the Western Front. Yeah, the enemy is attacking me on the Eastern Front, but I like the Western Front better. The scenery is nicer. So, this is the issue. And, 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 and one needs to understand its importance and the importance of supporting these places um, a great deal. Now, I, sa I keep using the word settlement, and it's an interesting word because the word settlement quite extraordinarily, does not appear anywhere in international law. There's no such international concept, settlements. Where do we get the word settlements from? It's a translation of the Hebrew word yeshuv, which literally means settlement, and refers to small startup communities on either side of the green line. Now, it's very interesting that for this international legal concept, the word that the world uses is a translation of a Hebrew word, because presumably violations of the underlying international legal norm, which I'll mention in a minute, happen around the world, and indeed they do happen around the world. So why use a particular Hebrew name for them, uh, unless the only ones you actually care about are uh, Israeli? It's, it's a bit of a tell. So what is the actual legal issue? There is a legal issue that s people mean when they have in, in, in mind settlements, but calling it settlements isn't very helpful because they are indeed settlements. You cannot argue that these are settlements. What's a settlement? It's when people go and they settle somewhere and start a community. It's a settlement. But that's not a legal question. The legal question is, is this deportation or transfer? And that's much, that, you see why now, now why, why, why people call it settlement. Because when a Jew builds a house on a hill, yes, he's a settler. He's settling. Now, it's much harder to say, ah, he's a deportee or transferee. How did he become a deportee or transferee? Who deported him and from where? So the Geneva Convention is a treaty about um, what the military can do to civilians in wartime and during occupation. There's a very good argument that the Geneva Convention does not apply in the West Bank at all. Why? Because the very principle, it applies in the territory for occupation of the territory of a high contracting party whose territory was the West Bank when Israel took it in 1967. It wasn't Jordan's. Everybody agreed that it wasn't Jordan's. So whose was it? Whoever it was, it was not a signatory of the Geneva Convention. But let's say that the Geneva Convention applies, as international lawyers want to say, for some reason. What is this provision that everyone talks about? So Article 49 of the Geneva Convention has six articles, six separate paragraphs each of which deals with action by the occupying power to change the demographic and ethnic makeup of the occupied territory. And the first five of them, which were all based on and inspired by things Nazi Germany did during World War II, are about different kinds of ethnic cleansing and moving around the people who are in the occupied territory, kicking them out or moving them around, the, the inhabitants of the occupied territory. Article 6, Article 49.6, and all the entire international legal discussion of settlements and their alleged illegality has to find itself is based on this one sentence. So you, have to, you should know this sentence well. That is the sentence. And this is the sentence which Israel supposedly violates. The occupying power shall not deport or transfer its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. So assume, for the sake of argument, that Israel is the occupying power. Two major issues arise. First of all, what's it mean to deport or transfer? What's it mean to deport or transfer? It suggests some kind of action. There's a dispute. Does that require forcible action or not forcible action? What if you just organize people and bust them in? So from the language, it's not clear. But clearly, it, it, it contemplates some organized, centralized, massive action. What, what seems to not count as deport or transfer? What if somebody decides to buy a house in Malay Dumim? a part of land, and they build a house. How can you say they've been deported or transferred? Whatever transfer means, it's very hard to imagine, to um, paraphrase Mitt Romney, that you could self-transfer, right? like self-deport. So could you self-transfer? What's that even mean? Could you self-transfer? Could you self-deport? So that's very hard to understand. So what, what about uh, one-third of the people living in the West Bank, roughly, have been born there? That's not called transfer. That's called delivered. So, so 
you see, but they are settlers. They're settlers because they're living in Yishuvim. They're living in Yishuvim. But are they transferees? How can someone born there be a transferee? Doesn't make any sense. So, but I think the bigger problem with the world's reading of this is who, who can violate 49.6? The occupying power. The occupying power. This is normal. What's the occupying power mean? Israel, assuming Israel is occupying. So who can't violate 49.6? Individuals, private parties, which is normal because this is a treaty and treaties govern governments, countries, not private action. The world wants to read this sentence as if it says, the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its civilian population and if they want to go of their own accord, shall do everything it can to stop them. Now, that maybe would be a good provision, maybe not, I don't know, but it's very far from the language of this one. Right? It doesn't say about stopping them, or making their life difficult, or not giving them food, or not giving them water, or starving them out. Let me prove the point that nobody's actually trying to construe this provision when they talk about settlements. You all know about illegal outposts? You've heard about illegal outposts? What are illegal outposts? Illegal outposts are settlements that violate Israeli municipal zoning laws. They don't have the right building permits, they don't have the right permits from the government to build. So if the government doesn't want them there, clearly the government hasn't deported or transferred them. So they should actually be called legal outposts. It's the legal outposts that, that are supposed to be the worst, the scariest. That, that's, there's no question, no question. They're the best ones. They must be legal. But no one, no one even suggests that, um, su suggests that distinction. Uh, what else do we see here? So, it's always a big to-do when someone builds a house in the West Bank. Um, when someone builds a house. Oh, by the way, often this is phrased as the government issues tenders. So you think maybe the government is deporting or transferring people. It's authorizing all this housing. But you have to understand what the baseline is. The government comes in and says no one can build in the West Bank. That's the baseline. Then, occasionally, due to various political pressures, they say, okay, you guys are really lobbying hard, we'll let you build a little. Right, so the government permits to build are not an encouragement, but a concession to the massive demand. Right? They're not airlifting these people in, which, by the way, other countries have done. Um, by the, so Jordan occupied, so, and if you need further evidence, what's the best way to learn about what deport or transfer means in the context of the West Bank? what Jordan did from 1949 to 1967. Now, unfortunately, we can't really learn anything from that because in the entire records of the United Nations, as far as I can tell, there was not a single discussion of the occupation of the West Bank by Jordan, let alone deportation, transfer. And they did build things and try to accomplish various uh, political objectives. They, built up, they were building a palace for uh, King Hussein in, um, in Jerusalem. But no one, no one said, oh, you're building. That's a violation of 49.6. No one thought of this. So if you want to know what a violation of 49.6 might look like, you might consider the cases of Morocco, which bust, shipped, and organized uh, hundreds of thousands of settlers into Western Sahara, which Morocco occupies as a belligerent occupier. And they now form probably the majority of the population there. Or, North, uh, or Turkey. Uh, a good ally of America, uh, which shipped tons of settlers into northern Cyprus, which it's occupying. Or Indonesia, which had a whole Indoniz Indonesization program of East Timor to ship in Javanese settlers. And when I mean organized, like, you know, they took villages, they gave them training for how to farm these new places and move the entire villages. And not only was this um, policy uh, not condemned by the world, it was actually supported by a World Bank grant. Uh, now, today I can give you some more current examples. Russia sends settlers into Abkhazia, Armenia into Nagorno-Karabakh, and people don't even know what this is. So, how many of those have been condemned as violations of 49.6? Not a single one. And the International Committee on the Red Cross, a Geneva-based organization which has appointed itself uh, the steward and official interpreter, of the Geneva Conventions, they produce a very useful legal document, like a reference book, called A Guide to State Practice under the Geneva Conventions. It's a pretty useful book. For each, I mean, there are many other things in the Geneva Conventions. And for each thing, 
It prints the laws of the various countries that deal with it, major court cases, UN statements, political statements about it, to, to tell you, you know, what countries think this means. And on 49.6, it goes on for pages. It's really, really long, about 49.6. And the only reference point is Israel. So I gave this talk the other day at Stanford, and uh, some people made an interesting point. Um, they said, look, of course there's some politicization of international law. So obviously the fact that they're not condemning East Timor, etc., so there's politics involved. Indonesia, they're not condemning China and Tibet, so there's politics. But that doesn't mean there's not also something real with that. But the question that has to be asked about the mix of law and politics is if in nine cases out of ten, they don't condemn, and in the tenth case they condemn, which is the law and which is the politics? Indeed, in international law, we interpret ambiguous treaties, and this is pretty ambiguous. No one really knows what they meant by deport or transfer. We ambiguous, um, ambiguous treaties by state practice, and state practice clearly suggests that the movement, at least semi-voluntary movement of, um, so I wouldn't even say all these countries are violating 49.6. So 49.6 seems to have been interpreted in a pretty minimal fashion because none of these things are considered uh, violations. Moreover, what's the remedy for a violation of 49.6? So we, we have taken for granted and accepted a very insulting idea that the remedy is the removal of all the Jews. That, that's a baseline thing, right? Peace treaty, Jews have to go. So why is that so? Why is that so? James Baker, no great friend of Israel, uh, sponsored a UN-backed plan, UN-backed plan for peace in uh, Morocco, between Morocco and Mauritania and Western Sahara. It didn't work out well, but the UN did endorse it. It did not call for the removal of a single Moroccan settler. The peace plan which did work in East Timor did not call uh, for the removal of a single Indonesian settler. Uh, and, so for, uh, and so forth. Indeed, they're actually allowed to vote in the referendum on what's supposed to happen to the place, uh, which is a neat trick now that they are the uh, majority. So only by Israel is there this notion that even if, there is, even if the Geneva Convention applies and even if 49.6 is at least partially violated, that the remedy is the removal of the transferees and their children and their children's children. Uh, and that strikes me as a non, not very liberal, uh, not very liberal notion. Um, the thing to look forward to in the coming weeks is the uh, Palestinian uh, bid for membership of the Uni United Nations. Now this may seem like uh, deja vu all over again. Uh, they tried to, uh, they sought membership in the Security Council, from the Security Council last year. So what's going on? So first of all, one has to understand this is a violation of the Oslo Accords, a complete abrogation, uh, as they uh, set final status issues, like the countries, uh, to negotiations. But the Security Council is the only body that can admit a country to the United Nations. The United Nations has a very clear membership acceptance procedure. It first has to be approved by the Security Council and then by the General Assembly. So they've given up for now on the Security Council Avenue. So what are they going to the General Assembly for? So there are kind of two parts to it. The General Assembly cannot accept them as a member. They can accept them as a non-member state. Well, what's that do for them? What's that do for them? First of all, it's just a, it's another occasion to have an anti-Israel vote, and that's that's a big uh, function. Um, so and it's going to be scary, and there are going to be many things said very critical of Israel. Remember, we've been through worse. The General Assembly, which is going to vote to make Palestine a non-member state, already voted that Zionism is racism, which means that presumably Israel has not, does not have any legitimate existence within any borders. Um, so we've seen worse from the General Assembly. Uh, so it has a kind of political, uh, a political effect. I th the primary use the Palestinians seem to think they're going to get out of this is to allow them to sue Israel in the International Criminal Court for violating Article 49.6. Here's a neat trick. When they were ratifying the charter of the International Criminal Court, they basically took all of the war crimes provisions of the Geneva Convention and they cut and pasted them and called them war crimes within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. That's how they defined war crimes. They didn't come up with a new definition, they just borrowed from the, that's a very normal thing. In one or two places, they changed the wording, just a little bit. It, both apparently to uh, pull in Israel. So for example, under the Charter of the International Criminal Court, 
the relevant provision is exactly the same, except it says transfer directly or indirectly. Ah, well, that's exactly what the Geneva Conventions doesn't say. And that underscores the absence of, the, of, of that language in the Geneva Conventions. However, so Israel is not a party to the ICC, so it doesn't have to worry about this now. It has not signed that treaty. But if the Palestinians can come in and say, well, we accept this treaty, we're a country, we can sign treaties, uh, then they hope to be able to sue Israel for violation of this treaty. And this makes Israelis very worried. Are they going to be able to travel uh, and so forth? Um, I think some of these concerns are, it's troubling. It will, there will be a new era of lawfare and it will be a focal point in a new delegitimization de campaign. But one needs to stay uh, a little bit calm. I don't know that the ICC is going to fall, fall over itself to take these lawsuits for a variety of reasons. Um, if, the, if the ICC has jurisdiction over alleged Israeli crimes in the West Bank, it also has jurisdiction over Palestinian crimes. And it will not be long before Israel starts pressing those charges. And I don't think the ICC wants to get involved with that. Uh, so it's not clear. I don't know how excited. I'm sure they don't like Israel. I'm sure uh, there's no love lost between the ICC and, and Israel. But they do want to project some kind of fairness. I think it would be very difficult for them just to take cases against Israel. Uh, and they may see themselves as uh, best off staying out of it, uh, staying out of it entirely. Um, but that's the advantage that, is, uh, that, uh, that, that, that they are seeking. It's a pretty technical thing. Now, what makes it particularly unusual is the General Assembly can at most admit them as a member, a uh, non-member state, so that you're a state. You're a state, okay. But saying that an entity is a state actually says nothing about their borders. So they want to have this kind of very unusual thing. They want to be recognized w as a state with the so-called 67 borders. So that's a very unusual thing. You know, when the General Assembly, t uh, w when India and Pakistan are admitted into the UN, there's no determination of the border, or Russia and Japan, or China and Japan. So half the members of the United Nations have border disputes with each other, and membership in the United Nations does not any kind of determination of where that border runs. So already it shows the political nature. If the United Nations actually votes that they are a state within the 67 borders, that is far from the membership function, uh, or the state recognition function, uh, of, uh, of the General Assembly and also seems to have no particular le legal force uh, in and of itself. Now, the interesting thing is the Palestinians already uh, have asked for statehood. They, they declared themselves a state in 1988. So this is not a new thing, right? This is, this is kind of like when Abbas threatens to you know, resign uh, from his uh, presidency, which expired four years ago. So it, it, it's it's not clear what the actual, what they're doing, right? So they declared themselves a state in 1988. They have observer status at the UN. So now they say, but now we'll really be a state. Palest the Palestinians are already recognized by uh, almost as many countries as recognize Israel. So it's not like they need the United Nations to say they're a state. They say they're a state. Most of the countries in the world say that they're a state. The only thing that this United Nations statehood thing does is A, serve as a kind of focal point for anti-Israel efforts, uh, like an occasion, an occasion for everyone to gang up, uh, and this very technical point about uh, jurisdiction of, uh, uh, of international tribunals. They're already a state. When the Palestinians get sued in U.S. courts for supporting terrorism, what's their defense? They don't say we didn't do it. They say sovereign immunity. We're a country. You can't, set, you can't sue us. And they've been saying that since 1988. And indeed, they actually do have many aspects of a country. No. They have a telephone calling code, a top-level internet domain name, their own army, a central bank which prints money, ministries, embassies all around the world, they travel, they conduct business like a country, they have their own TV programs, which does not seem like are censored by Israel. Uh, they have control over more than 90% of the Palestinian population. It actually, in many ways, looks like a country. And this is the fundamental tension of the Palestinian claim. On the one hand, they, they like having a country. They don't want this taken away from them. They want the UN to reaffirm their countryness. On the other hand, they want to keep saying occupation. And this is why this General Assembly thing is not going to be the end of the story, because they want to be a country, but they want to be occupied at the same time. 
and and it's conceptually possible, but they don't want to go all the way down the road of countryhood because then Israel will say, look, you have your phones, you have your army, you have control of the people, okay, you're a country, stop bothering us. Ah, well then, so, but we don't have all the land we want. Ah, well that has nothing to do with occupation of being a country, that's, a that's called a border dispute. That's not apartheid, that's a border dispute. Half the countries in the world have that. So this, this is the tension. And whenever you hear someone say apartheid, ask them, should Israel negotiate with the uh, democratically elected Palestinian leadership? Of course, of course they should. But wait, if they have democratically elected leadership, how can we say that we don't let them vote? Right, because the Palestinians, they want to vote, but they want to vote twice, which I'm sympathetic to coming from Chicago. They want to elect the... They want to elect the government of the Palestinian Authority, and then they say, and if you don't give us what we want, we'll demand to vote in Israeli elections. So this is the fear, by the way, and this is the big fear. When President Obama says he's really a friend of the Jews, he's a friend of Israel, he's saying, look, I am saving you from this horrible thing where the Palestinians are going to come and vote in the Israeli elections, uh, and that will be presumably the end of Israel. So I don't know even if that would be the end of Israel, but they're never going to do it. Right? Why? Because t if they were to say, we want a one-state solution, let's all just vote in Israeli elections. Presumably that would mean that the entire Palestinian Authority and all these ambassadors and all this recognition and all this nice stuff and all the money they get from Europe would be disbanded. Right? You couldn't have the Palestinian government and the Israeli government and Mahmoud Abbas, who's you know, now the mayor of Ramallah, would then be the, the leader of a small faction in the Knesset. And he'd go from having an army to having a driver. So it's very hard to understand why they would actually want that. Now, to put this another way, the Palestinians were given a lot of stuff under Oslo. You know, all of this, a country, government, recognition, army, central bank, control, complete control of their own affairs, and the apartheid claim is a very odd one in that it doesn't recognize that at all. And indeed, all of the rhetoric about the peace process is as if none of this ever happened. Uh, so when we, and when we hear the scare tactic, it's the big scare tactic, they're going to vote in Israeli elections. They say, great, we'll vote in Palestinian Authority elections. We're, and we're not going to vote for Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, so if they're voting in Israeli elections, presumably the settlers can be voting for Danny Dayan to be another you know, head of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and, and that will be a, an interesting situation. Uh, but I think it's a situation which nobody wants, and so I don't think it's going to happen. So a lot of the things that we're, that, that we're supposed to be afraid of seem conceptually impossible. Uh, and are, are bogeymen or, or, or non sequiturs. So I think we should feel a little bit better about that. Uh, now, finally, what's the next four years going to look like? People are concerned because uh, the president mentioned in various contexts that he'll have more flexibility in, in the next four years. So I think he, he, he might wish he has more flexibility, but in fact, there may not be so much flexibility because the world actually, ha events proceed on a course of their own. And right now, Egypt, uh, Israel has a hot southern border with Egypt, a very hot border with Gaza, being shelled from Syria for the first time in 30 years, and the entire Arab world is, a, is, is, is uh, turned upside down. And I think if there's you know, any real serious efforts to make peace between anyone, in Israel and anyone, Israel I think could very reasonably ask to have the peace that was already made remade before new pieces are made uh, that will go the, the, way, the, way, the way of the, uh, of the old pieces. So events take on a course of their own uh, uh, and the real world may give, may, give, may give the president less flexibility. I'm just going to give you a concrete example um, to end on. We forget, we, we forget all the things that we were promised. So before the Arab Spring, uh, during the settlement freeze push, one of the things President Obama suggested he would deliver after people suggested he was being unfair and only asking for concessions from Israel, he said, look, remember Thomas Friedman's uh, Arab, uh, Arab peace plan where all the Arab countries would recognize Israel if they make peace with Palestinians? We'll give you like a little down payment. Like some of the more mellow Arab countries, Morocco, whatever, will open a consulate. Egypt will like send a dance troupe or whatever, you know, some kind of higher, better culture. Some, someone will allow overflights, right? Maybe uh, some Arab countries that don't will allow overflights on the way to India. Um, that, w that didn't happen. It turned out that the Arab countries had no interest even on those minor, minor, minor concessions. But now it seems hilarious to even suggest it. Right? No Arab leader, when faced with the, the, the rising Islamicism, uh, is going to make the, even the smallest concession. Not even. 
a dance troupe. So even the smallest things that one think uh, that, 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 were, that were thought of um, have fallen have fallen by the wayside, and, and that shows really that there's probably less flexibility than the administration uh, might might wish. I bet they're frustrated. I bet they would hope that they could get at least some token gestures from Arab countries, um, but they can't, and that does reduce their flexibility. I'm very eager to hear your questions. Okay, what's the question again? Question go through. Any possibility? A peace treaty. I can imagine circumstances under which a treaty would be drafted that is not the same as there being peace. So for example, and let me give you two, two polar examples. There is a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. That doesn't mean there's peace. Uh, there's, a, there's a hot border, there's very difficult relations, and, and there's the prospect of that treaty being, being torn up, which robs Israel of much of the benefit of that treaty, which is not having to mobilize large numbers of men and keep people in the room for a long time, worrying about the Egyptian border. Syria, on the other hand, we never had the benefit of a peace treaty with Syria, and that border was quiet, as quiet as the Egyptian border and quieter uh, since 1973. So you can have peace without a treaty and a peace treaty without peace. So those, those two are, are two very different things. I can imagine there being a treaty. I can imagine the United States saying to Israel, uh, here's what you have to sign or we will not veto Security Council resolutions against you and there will be an economic boycott. And I can imagine uh, Israeli leaders getting scared and uh, going on. So I can imagine a treaty. I mean, indeed, there already was a peace treaty. Oslo is a, is a kind of peace treaty. Oslo is a treaty which provides for an end of hostilities between Fatah, the PLO, and Israel, and, and a transfer to a diplomatic track. So that transfer worked for a few years until it stopped working. Okay. Um, do you support Israel's annexation of all of Judea and Samaria, or at least Area C? Why or why not? Um, yeah. It's a hard question. Uh, so that's politics, and I leave pure politics to the politicians. Uh, though I'm not sure it's necessary. I'm not sure it's necessary. Um, it would be internet. It would have a huge international diplomatic cost, and it's not clear what the benefit would be. However, however, annexation is useful as a tool to keep as leverage. That is to say, the problem Israel has is it, keep, it has to put up with a lot and can never do anything in return. So the Palestinians can continue violating Oslo, and Israel, on the other hand, uh, has its hands tied. So I think a posture of saying, if you do X, Y, and Z to stray from Oslo, and you take unilateral measures, we have unilateral measures that we ourselves will take. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's quite useful. Uh, the problem with annexation is I think full annexation is just not going to happen as a political reality. And partial annexation seems to concede the rest of it. And this is not a time for concessions. What's important, what's important, you don't see the world campaigning against annexation. Most of they probably don't think it's going to happen. What, what's the world worried about? They're worried about Jews living in Yesha, in Yehuda and Shimon. That's what they're worried about. So if that's what they're worried about, that suggests that that must be a great source of strength for us. Right? If, if the Palestinians see this as a threat, one of the claims that was made about uh, the, the administration's good relations with Israel is, look at all the military cooperation, right? all the technical cooperation. You don't hear the Palestinians complaining about the technical military cooperation. They're not saying, what are you doing? Right? They're not complaining. The fact that they're not complaining means that's not where the battle is being fought. Right? So. A not bad policy is a continuation of normal life, building communities, people continuing with their lives, things going on, and, and, and that takes on a, a reality all of its own. The, pro the problem with annexation is, unless it's a complete annexation, which I think entirely unrealistic, it's, a, it's an implicit concession. Yeah. Okay, a one of the requirements for a state is a, quote, permanent population. Mm -hmm. Can a state that defines itself as refugees from another geographic area and that seeks to, quote, return, unquote, there, meet that requirement? Yeah, that's just posturing. Permanent population just means people who live in the same place, like, all the time. You know, whether they say they came from somewhere else or want to go from somewhere else does not really uh, get to the essence of a state. I mean, they say they're refugees, 
but uh, some of them say they're refugees, but you know many of them have been in there all their lives. And that the, the criteria of permanent population is quite minimal. It's supposed to exclude like um, people setting up a country on an oil platform, or in you know, a somewhere where there's not actually people living, or like a whaling station. Uh, so permanent population means the people who are live, born, and die there, and it seems to satisfy that criteria. Another one here. What can be done about UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, so that's a very easy organization to deal with if, the, if, if, if people were interested in it. Uh, so it's heavily financed by the United States, like most of the United Nations. And the way to deal with it is to uh, remove that money. The, the defunding of UNESCO in response to the accepting Palestinian statehood was a, was a powerful tool. A powerful tool. The president didn't want to do it, tries to find ways around it. That's a powerful tool. And it would be, you know, it would be useful to have that happen with the... Uh, so what's important for the next four years is to remember that the Democratic Party has not historically been hostile to Israel. The president, I think, I, I think the president is hostile to Israel, but this is not the Democratic Party. And you guys have two senators here who uh, could be very powerful voices, and it's good to have good relationships with them. And for the next four years, the Senate is going to be a powerful voice uh, and an important potential check. And there's a lot that Congress can do. There's a lot that Congress can do in trying to make funding to these institutions tied to them behave in, way, in, in ways which America sees as consistent with, with its interests. And that's something which senators and congressmen should be encouraged to pursue. How do you think the Arab Spring will affect Israel? I think it's a great thing for Israel. Um, I think it's a great thing for Israel. Um, in the end, in the end, it's hard to say how. But the Arab, the Arab Spring, removes. I think it makes it very hard to say with a straight face that Israel is the central problem in the Middle East, the central complaint of Arab peoples, or really the principal destabilizing factor in in the Middle East. Now, the fact that it makes it hard to say does not mean the Europeans won't keep saying it. Uh, indeed, they will. There's a, there's a kind of structure of argument that's called the now more than ever argument. So when you have the stable Arab dictators, so you have these stable guys, they can get business done. Now more than ever, you have to make a deal with them. Then there's the Arab Spring, and you get these Islamists as governments. Okay, now that we got rid of those bad dictators and have popularly elected governments with legitimacy, now more than ever. So from the perspective of, 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 of certain sectors, it doesn't really matter what happens. They'll still say the exact same thing. If you remember when Arafat was in charge, he was the leader of the Palestinian National Movement. He was a guy in a, okay, he was a terrorist, but he was the leader. So if you make a deal with him, that will be a real deal. He's the guy you should deal with. When he died, n ah, that bad terrorist Abbas, uh, Arafat's dead. Now we have the Abbas, he wears a suit, now more than ever. So now more than ever, Abbas is not going to get together with Hamas. That shows he's an honest guy. Now more than ever, we should make a deal with him. Ah, Abbas has signed a deal with Hamas. Now the Palestinians are united, so it would be a real deal. Now more than ever. So the now more than ever argument really not much can trip it up. But for, I think, the honest observer, uh, and, and I think for the Obama administration, it's, it's almost impossible for it not to downgrade Israel as, 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 a, as a priority. This Israel-Palestinian peace is a kind of a luxury good that can you know, really only be sought if, uh, if there's not actual, 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 if you don't have Benghazi. Uh, Benghazi makes it very hard to say we're going to be trying to do the, 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 the um, this, this kind of fine-tuning in places where there are not riots and instability. Okay, a legal question. As an attorney myself, I do not understand the, quote, jurisdictional, unquote, issues. That is, when two countries have a disagreement, usually there is a treaty whereby two or more nations, quote, contract mm. to certain terms. International law is not based on contractual agreements. Therefore, what grants jurisdiction such that one country can sue another? So the International Criminal Court is, is based on treaty, and countries basically have to consent to it. But the way it works is that a, a country can consent to the ICC's jurisdiction, and when it does so, that means it has jurisdiction over things that happen within that country. So what that means is the Palestinians will say, look, this is our country, and we sign up for ICC jurisdiction. Ah, Israel is doing things in our country, and we have consented for our country to be within the jurisdiction of the ICC. So things that other powers do within our country would fall within the jurisdiction of the ICC. That's a, that's a watertight argument if you accept that that's their country. 
that, uh, if, if you think they're right on the borders issue. Israel would say, no, no, that's not your country. This is, so that's, that, that's, that, that, that's the issue. Do you believe it would be wise for the Israeli government to adopt the findings of the Levy report? And what do you think the international repercussions would be? So the Levy report is very complicated, and I really can't go into it here, because the Levy report said some smart things, and said a lot of the things I say and do say, and it talks about the uh, League of Nations resolution, which is very important, and the basis for everything that comes, that, uh, that comes after it. The, League of Na the, the, the Levy report is important for the following reason. It was for the first time there was serious pushback from establishment legal figures on the standard narrative that Israel is, is, is an unlawful occupier and the settlements are illegal. It used to be there were lots of people who said that, Stephen Schwebel and Eugene Rostow. Uh, this, was not, this was not a minority position at one point, but it has get, but gone, gotten drowned out by an academic consensus, um, a kind of academic echo chamber. And raising the issue and saying, look, you know, it's not settled. We don't think it's settled. That's very valuable. This, on the specifics, the Levy report could have been better written. Some of their arguments could have been better, tighter, different, and so forth. Uh, I think there's no reason to adopt the Levy Commission report because it's not the best statement of the arguments it seeks to advance. And on something so important, you should go with the, the best. And it doesn't, again, it's a symbolic act. It doesn't really do anything to adopt the Levy Commission report. And why should the government adopt it unless it agrees with everything in it, which I think it would be hard to do. Uh, the Levy report is, is an occasion. Right? It's an occasion to say, ah, we were told that all serious legal minds could only have one view of this. Here we have three people, up until now. Now we find out they're not serious because they have this view. But until we knew they had this view, they were considered serious. Uh, uh, and it seems that the, the, they're not particularly this consensus. Maybe the consensus is, 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 is vulnerable. So I think that's the proper, the proper understanding of the role of the Levy report. Why was the Golan Heights given to Syria? In, you mean under the, under the Sykes-Picot, under the British-French agreement? I think the, the, the French gave something to the British also, some kind of trade. I forget the details. But there were, I mean, there were not really Jews there, or anyone, actually. Um, just like today. There was basically a lot, n no one there. Um, and they had some kind of swap, but I forgot what, what Britain got for it. Uh, Security Council Resolution 242 said that Israel should withdraw to secure and recognize boundaries. Since the mandate for Palestine set the Jewish state's borders at the, jo or at the Jordan River in the east and at the Mediterranean Sea in the west, why wasn't this referenced when SCR was uh, drafted in 1967? So it does say secure and recognize boundaries, but if you, re you recall, the conquests of 1967 were of two kinds. The restoration of the League of Nations mandate, the West Bank and Gaza, and also the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights. And those stand on very different international legal footing. Like if you asked anyone in 1967, who's the West Bank belong to? They wouldn't say Jordan, and they wouldn't say the Palestinians. They'd probably say, eh, kind of up in the air. But if you asked anyone in 1967, who does the Sinai Peninsula belong to? If you asked any Israeli, Egypt. I mean, it did belong to Egypt. So Israel could withdraw. I mean, these things are not inconsistent. Israel could withdraw with secure uh, and recognized borders without uh, actually giving up any of the uh, League of Nations mandate. If a country is being attacked, like Israel is being attacked uh, by Gaza, what is the international law saying about a right to retaliate? Yeah, um, that's, it's, it's a war. You, of course, of course, allowed to retaliate. This is not, not a question about it. There's not a question. Please address. But, which, which again, I think we have to remember that there's a difference between international law and reality. So a lot of Israelis, they, they, they think, look, if we just give the Palestinians a country, then like no one will have any claim on us, we'll be done, we'll be queen, no one will be able to say anything to us. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Right? If Israel were to heavily bomb Gaza now under international law, nobody could say anything. It's clearly what the United States would do. The United States did a lot worse to Fallujah. In, in, the, in, the, in, in the Iraq war. But just because uh, it seems that there wouldn't be a basis doesn't mean it's, I mean, when Israel left Gaza, this was the argument. We'll leave, and then if anyone does anything, ah, we'll get them, and who could say anything? And then uh, Operation Cast Lead uh, proved that it turns out um, people will say things. Please address the Iran threat. Um, 
out of my realm of expertise. That's a complicated security question. I don't think we should couch it as an Israeli issue. I think that's the big con of the Iranians. I think the reason they keep talking about nuking Israel is it makes the Europeans and the Americans feel temporarily safe to let them build the weapon that they're building, and which will be a problem for the whole world. And how do I know it's not a pro just a problem for Israel? Because if it was primarily a problem for Israel, the Saudis and the Egyptians wouldn't be having heart attacks about it also. It's a con. It's not our job to do. And that, that, that's my view of it. I mean, maybe the stakes are so high that even if it is a con, we have to do it anyway. It may be an irresistible con. But we have to remember that, that Israel is only... It would be very bad for Israel. It would be very bad for Israel. But I would avoid a, a, a kind of rhetoric that would frame this as Israel's problem, that it would be a favor if America helped Israel out, that uh, Israel wants to deal with Iran and the rest of the world. It's not in their interest. Uh, um, it's in their interest too. They're, they're cowards, or they don't have the capacity, or I don't, I don't know, or they don't think it's necessary. But this is not just an Israel issue. Uh, when Iran gets the nuclear bomb, the price of oil is going to go through the roof, and that would be a disaster for every industrialized country. I mean, they they know this. They're, so mm -hmm. the the only thing I could say about the Iran threat is it goes far beyond Israel. Finally, uh, written questions. Are there any good books that further discuss the legal aspect to the Judea-Samaria settlement issue? Um, there's some good articles by Dory Gold, monographs sort of available on the Jerusalem Council for Public Affairs uh, webpage. Um, there are, I have not come across any good books, as a matter of fact, but I, I, I'm hopefully writing one. Um, but it's, by the way, also, you know, my father, uh, often complains there's also no good history of Israel written from like a strongly pro-Israel perspective. The mainstream history is a little bit uh, watered down uh, at best, or at least written from a, from a very um, labor perspective. Uh, and that's in English at least. I don't know what there is in Hebrew. Uh, so there is not such a book. I don't think you need a whole book necessarily. But so Dora Gold, Dora Gold sketches out the good argument. Ellie, Ellie Hertz, who we mentioned as your friend, has uh, good articles online sketching out the arguments. You don't necessarily need a book. What, in your estimation, is the future of Egypt and Israeli relationships within Egypt, or with Egypt, rather? I, I don't think there are any more Israeli relationships with Egypt. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it seems. It seems that the, their future, as with the future of much of the Muslim world, is with the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the rising power. Th these things go in cycles. So it used to be that Pan-Arabism and Arab, kind of Arab National Socialism was uh, the main mover, and everyone wanted to get with that, even if they didn't believe it. Nasser didn't start off as a what would come to be called a Nasserite. Right? Started off as something else. But this, when, th when this was seen as the strong thing. Uh, everyone got behind that, and now there is a, a new wave, and that wave seems to be the Brotherhood. Whether the Brotherhood is, is bad or good, but th th this, is, this is the new power, which I think underscores the limits of dealing with Fatah. Fatah is a dinosaur. Fatah is actually an Arab nationalist party. That's, it's like the only one left. Uh, every, uh, if Assad falls especially. It's the only one left. It's, it's like a historical curiosity. In a, in, a, in a sea of um, increasingly Islamic governments. And so it's very unlikely to think that, at least unless Israel is protecting it, it will um, survive mu much longer. I don't know. I, I can hear both sides. What, a disease? Oh. Please discuss water rights uh, if Northwest Bank is in the hands of the Palestinians and Golan in, high in the hands of Syria. Uh, water would be a problem, but I don't think it would be the biggest problem. I think the biggest problem would be what's happening now from Gaza to Ashkelon would be happening to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and people wouldn't be sticking around for the water.